700,000. But I don't want you just to hear from me. Why don't you turn your attention to the screen so you can see it for yourself. Our Savior's Church, Torin here. Thank you so much for the ways that you guys have supported us, prayed for us, sowed into this. We wouldn't be here without you, and we're so grateful. God bless you. What an amazing reminder that you're not just giving to the church, but you're giving through the church. It's because of your generosity that Torn was able to open up first Sunday with 3,500 people, three services. That's amazing. Uh, when we opened up, we had 150 people. So just a little bit different. <laughs> but so grateful for you guys, for your giving. Thank you for continuing to be such a generous church. As always, a reminder, there are three ways to give here at OSC. The first is in person. As the ushers begin to pass the containers, the second is by going online at OurSaviorsChurch.com forward slash give. This is the way that my wife and I love to give. It's by setting up reoccurring giving online. That's how we make sure that giving is always, always our very first priority. Or lastly, you can give by texting OSC Family to 833-271-8565. Only have one thing for you today, just one. Uh, this morning is small group launch. We're launching small groups this morning. Come on, that's a big dig. Put your hands together. <laughs> Two ways for you to join a small group. Uh, the first one is by going online. You know, how many of you are introverts? I'm just joking, you're not gonna raise your hand because you are an introvert. But <laughs> introverts here, if you're like, I don't really like people, it's okay, it's all right. Not all of us like people. If that's you, you can actually do that undercover at oscgroups.com. If you're just, you don't wanna talk to people, you go on oscgroups.com. We have singles groups, we have men's groups, women's groups, uh, addiction groups, we have financial groups. Uh, so many different opportunities for you to join, man. OSCgroups.com. And if you're like me and you're an extrovert and you want to talk to someone in person, then you can do that immediately after service. Right when you walk out in the lobby, you'll see a big small group sign and you can join a group there. Well, Pastor Jacob has such a great message prepared for us this morning. First, turn your attention to the screens. I was prompted to join a small group by our campus pastors. Um, highly encouraged to do so. I grew up in church and really felt like small group was something that was for a new Christian, um, someone who needed to be discipled and not for someone who has been in church their whole life. Um, I'm so glad that I did though. It's been life changing. It's all good for us all to get together on Sunday and praise and worship, but it's that Monday through Saturday. That's where your small group really comes in. Meeting other men going through the same uh, stuff in life, uh, just building that relationship. Um, that's gonna be relationships that'll last forever. I, I never had a one-on-one uh, -on -one or even a group of girls, a core group of women that I could sit down and just share my heart with. And for me, I didn't realize how much I needed that. Also to have women that are able to give me wisdom, older women that are able to give wisdom to me on situations of where I'm at, and also for me to be able to um, pull up the younger generation and be like, hey, you can get through this. I feel like small groups have just really done that for us. It's really helped grow me, uh, get me out of my shell. I've learned to trust people more than um, then before, especially with other men, I've realized now that I can reach out to, there's men in my group that I can reach out to whenever I'm having issues or, or we're having issues or whatever, it, it just really helps. Um, I was reading this morning in Hebrews and it was saying to not forsake joining together. And especially at this time in the world where it's dark that we need each other, we need to um, sharpen each other. It's nice to be able to go and sit and have coffee with somebody and just you know read the word together or, or actually help you get further into the word, especially whenever you don't know and you don't know where to start. Small groups are one of the best things that have ever happened to us. Yeah, I, I can definitely say that without a small group, we would not be where we are today. Correct. It has definitely um, impacted our lives for the, for the good.
Well, at the beginning of the year, we asked you to begin the first 24. Okay, somebody was sitting in the pews <laughs> the first few weeks, and we asked you, and we said the first 24 was taking the first seven minutes and... Okay, I know some of you only understand sign language. Uh, so the first seven minutes was? The second seven minutes was? The word. The third seven minutes was? Prayer, making your prayer list and going over your prayer list. And then the final three minutes was? The faith declarations for you and your family. I'm a born-again, blood-washed, spirit-filled child of God. Both me and my household shall be saved. Acts 16, 31. So our job... And calling from God is to help you grow on your spiritual life. We keep telling you over and over again that you're an eternal spiritual being having a temporary physical experience on earth. You're an eternal spiritual being having a temporary physical experience on earth. And so our responsibility is to challenge you to grow spiritually in every way that you can. So the first 24, if you'll, if you'll do that, in a 30-day consistent period, remember I told you, if you miss a day or two, ask God to forgive you, get up and just keep going right on. Keep going right on. And so the second thing I've discovered that actually brings true life transformation, after being born again, there are three life-changing moments of a person's life, okay? When you're born again, when you get married, and when you have children, we can hear that in the crowd even now. <laughs> the, the, those three things, they, they, they change your life, correct? Yeah. After that, people don't change quickly and they don't change often unless crisis comes. But you know what I've discovered? There is something else that can help move you on your spiritual journey. Now, it's amazing. People love talking about their relationship with God. How many of you love your relationship with God? How many of you love talking to Jesus? How many of you know he'll talk to you whatever mood you're in? How many of you know no matter what you tell him, he's still nice? How many of you know that your husband isn't like that? Your children are not like that. Your best friend is not like that. Do you know why? Because it doesn't take any grace for us to live with God, but it takes a whole lot of grace for us to live with people. Someone said it like this, to live above with those you love, well, that will be glory. To live below with those you know, I mean, that's another story. <laughs> And so you and I know it, it, we, being with people causes us to grow. And so after those three moments, I believe, I believe that the next transformative thing happens when you connect in a small group. And we have some amazing, Michelle and I have led marriage small groups for years. I lead a men's small group every Tuesday morning. Joseph's led a small, so pastor, what group should I get in? How many of you have ever gone through freedom? Raise your hand. Freedom is the first step. Freedom really helps you get over your yesterday so you can move into your tomorrows. You, you can't move into tomorrow until you deal with yesterday. And it doesn't go away with age. It doesn't. You're going to hear about that today. And so I want to challenge you. Maybe, maybe it's a step out of your comfort zone. But I want to challenge you as your pastor. If you'll trust me. Do you trust me? Okay, hopefully you're here because you trust the spiritual guidance and direction that we give you as a pastoral staff. But you know what? I can give it to you, but you still have to receive it. So I, I want to challenge you, if you're not in a small group, sign up to get it. We have financial small groups. Let me tell you this. After giving your life to Jesus and who you marry, the third biggest decision of your life is how you deal with money. Because if you don't deal with money, money deals with you. Most money, most people that, that struggle in their marriage struggle because of money. And many of you grew up like me. Nobody taught you how to deal with money. You had to learn on your own. And so all of those groups are available for you. And I want to challenge you to step forward, lead your wife. If you're single, step out. On Tuesday night, I am so grateful and so thankful. One of the greatest gifts God has given this house is Devin Brown. Devin, stand up. Come on, Devin, stand up and wave at everybody. 
Devin ran a 70-bed treatment center in Abbeville, and we hired him four years ago, and we helped last year, we helped 290 people's families that were struggling with addiction. We sent 90 of them. Well, we're at 90, right now, I, I spoke to uh, uh, Michael Hankins yesterday, our transgender, we're at 98 people that we've sent to a year-long Christ-centered treatment that you paid for. How cool is that? I, I've been a daddy on the other end of that. It makes an enormous difference. So thank you. So if you wonder where your money is going, that's where your money is going. And you know what I love to tell you? Remember when we gave away that modular home for Christmas? to the lady whose home burned down in a fire. I love giving away your money. It's one of the most exciting things I do. <laughs> but it is your money. And if you get excited, you know Torn Wells Church Plant, Michelle and I were there along with the Mendozas and uh, Brandon and, and his wife, Amy Robinson. We were there, we flew up there. They were a part of helping with the plant. That is the largest single church plant in U.S. history. 3,500 people the first Sunday. It was amazing. There were more Mexicans. They heard I was coming. <laughs> pastor Steve, our pastor in Mandeville, says that when, when Mexicans see me that are shorter than me, they all walk up and go, Poppy, Poppy. They, they, all, they all wanted, Pastor Christian, you understand. They, they, they all wanted a tall Mexican daddy, and I'm, 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 I, guess, I guess I'm him. I'm him. Well, next week, I'm going to be speaking about a Super Bowl marriage. I'm going to be talking to you about the keys to have you have a successful marriage. If you're single, you need to hear it. If you're divorced, you need to hear it. If you're married, you have to hear it. First, let me just give all of you men here an update. Valentine's Day is coming, and it's still on the 14th. Like some of y'all, it's on the 14th every year. So I know I don't want you to be that moron at Albertsons at 6 o'clock in the morning trying to buy the scraggly flowers that are left in the only card that's like the bereaved, like someone, it's one of those blank cards, that's the only one left. My sympathies. <laughs> I don't want to be at your funeral, so be sure that you get early to wherever you got to get it to make plans for what you're going to get. Ladies, you're welcome. Oh yeah, he forgot. Well, today I want to take a moment and talk to you about a disease that's crippling all of the world. It's not a new disease. As a matter of fact, it's as old as the Garden of Eden. You might ask, well, Pastor, what, what, what kind of disease is this? Is it, is it cancer? Is it corona? Corona beer? That, that's the virus taking over Acadiana. This is much more dangerous and much more deadly than all the diseases you can imagine. And man, is it contagious. Let me give you the first five diseases that people die from. 647,000 people die each year from heart disease. 620,000 died last year from cancer. 169,000 died from accidents. 160,000 died from respiratory diseases. 146,000 died from strokes. 10,000 died because they forgot Valentine's Day. Just thought I'd throw that in there for you. I'm just throwing that up under accidents. <laughs> that was funny. <laughs> While every loss is, is, is sad, the disease I want to speak to you about today is a disease you can only acquire if you choose to get it. If you choose to get it. You say, Pastor, who, who would want to choose a disease that's that deadly, that is that contagious, that hurts everyone around them? Well, you'll find out today. But the great thing is you can choose to get it, but you can also choose to not get it, to release it. In our Bible story today, Jesus was talking to his disciples about this disease and and let's look in and listen to the conversation in Luke chapter 17, verse 1. And for these last several weeks, we began, many of you know, our newest campus is in Abbeville. And so they are joining us in each one of these services. So would you welcome the Abbeville campus? Come on, the youngest edition of our Savior's Church. 
Luke chapter 17, verse 1, it says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, read it with me, it is it is impossible. Now, remember, Jesus also said all things are possible. So the Jesus that said all things are possible is about to tell us something that is impossible. It is impossible that no offenses should come to you, but woe to him to whom they come. Luke 17, the Amplified Version, verse 1 says this, stumbling stones, come on, say it with me, stumbling stones, that's another word for offense, temptations and traps set to lure one to sin. The word offense in biblical times actually meant bait on a stick. So if you could imagine a trap and there was bait on the stick inside there and the animal goes in to get the bait and when it gets the bait, boom, the trap closes and they're caught. He says, stumbling blocks, temptations, and traps to lure one to sin are sure to come, but woe, judgment is coming to him to whom they come. Then he goes on. It would be better for him if a millstone, which was about 2,000 pounds that was pulled by oxen to grind uh, grain, were hung around his neck and he would thrown into the sea, then he should offend one of these little ones. So, here's the warning. Take heed to yourself. Watch yourself. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. If he repents, how many of you are good with that? That I came to you and said, that hurt my feelings. And, and, and you said, I'm sorry. And I forgave you. How many are good with that? How many practiced that this week? Wow. I'm glad I'm preaching this message. <laughs> okay. Here's the part that I don't know if you practice a week. And if he sins against you seven times a day, and seven times a day returns to you saying, read it with me, you And listen to this. This next statement, the apostles didn't say when Jesus walked on water. They didn't say when he turned a happy meal into feeding 5,000. They didn't say when he turned the Cajun miracle, when he turned water into wine. Then they looked at Jesus after he said, forgive seven times a day. And the apostles said to the Lord, Jesus, you, you, you got something we don't have. <laughs> Increase our faith. So the Lord said, if you have the faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this, and he points to a mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted into the sea, it will obey you. As soon as Jesus finished teaching this, he encounters 10 men in Luke 17, 12, and it says this, and as he entered the village, he was met by 10 lepers who stood at a distance. How many lepers was there? 10 is the number of testing. These are lepers, and they stood at a distance. First, I want to show you what a mulberry tree looks like. That's a mulberry tree. Look at the roots. Because no matter how big it is, look how deep the roots grow. Jesus knew that. He made everything that was. And he said, I want you to know that there is a way that you can forgive things that are deep, that have been deep in your life. You were molested. You were abused. Your daddy left you. Your mama cursed you. Someone wronged you. Someone abused you. You were molested. Someone did the unthinkable to you. Jesus says there is a way that you can get even deep roots out of your life. You got to get deep roots out of your life. Now, it's interesting because I believe that unforgiveness is spiritual leprosy. It's spiritual leprosy. And I'm going to talk a bit about leprosy in just a moment. But, but what was Jesus teaching us in this passage? I believe he gives us five biblical truths that will help you learn to, learn to forgive. The first thing he says is, it's impossible to go through life and not be and not be offended. Now, one of the things you heard me talk about is the word offense is bait on a stick or it's a stumbling stone. Ryan, give it up for Pastor Ryan, our pastor from Abbeville. Here we go. Let me, let me tell you what that means, okay? I'm going to my mother-in-law's house for Thanksgiving. Okay? I know every year they're going to say something stupid. Every year there's going to be an insult. 
You know how they are. Okay? You know what that is? That's a stumbling stone. I can either let it hit a child over there. (laughs) Or you know what I can do? I can step by it. Or you know what I can do? I can hold on to it. I'm going to show you something. Come back up here. I don't understand why people don't get close to me. I just try to get close to people. Just people just everywhere I go. I went to that church. No one will be close to me. I tried getting that smoke. Nobody was close to me. Everybody, I mean, they just don't get close to me. Did it ever occur to you that you might be holding on to something that is keeping people from getting close to you? Jesus is telling you that it's not optional whether you're going to be offended. He actually says it's impossible for you not to be offended. But holding on to offense is an option. Pastor, you don't know. I've been hurt. Stand in line. I can tell you one way to never be hurt. Are you ready? This is guaranteed. Die. You've heard me say this before, but I want to repeat it because it's true. All people are going to hurt you. You just have to decide who's worth hurting for. That's why I shared with you the quality of your life is determined by how you resolve conflict. Conflict between you and God. When I'm not right with God, I'm miserable. I'm I'm edgy. I'm aggravated. How I resolve conflict with me and God. I resolve a conflict with me and my wife. Me and my wife. Do you know what I've discovered? People that get close to you don't bring something out of you that's not in you. They expose what's already been there, but you've never let anybody close enough to get it out. One guy said to me, Pastor, you don't understand. They just bring the devil out of me. I said, well, why is the devil in you? Why is the devil in you? Being offended, Jesus said, it is impossible. It's going to be rolled at you. Those traps are going to be set by you. But the Bible says we're not ignorant of Satan's devices. How many of you know where you go, where you know where you're going, where people don't care for you? Raise your hand. How many of you know the relatives that aggravate the devil out of you? Raise your hand. How, okay. Then at least be smart enough to know it's going, they're going to be rolling it in me. I don't have to pick it up and go, okay, there it is. I told you it was coming. Every time we come over to Boudreaux's house, they do that. And if you're a Boudreaux, I'm sorry. Every time we go over to Fontenot's house, they do that. It doesn't matter who it is. The devil is always going to be using someone and something to come at you. But you have an option of letting it roll by or running and picking it up and adding it to all the rest of the pain of your life. And you know what's weird? You think this is just been between you and the person that hurt you. You carry it with you, and it's between you and everybody you come in contact with. Today, we don't have to live offended. Though these traps and stumbling stones are sent by the enemy through people to cause you to fall and to keep you in bondage to your past and to pain of your past, you don't have to hold them. Here's number two. Forgiveness is not rooted in my faith in people. It's rooted in my faith in God. Gee, the disciples didn't say, Lord, give us more faith in people. They said, give us more faith in God. In Luke 17, verse 4 and 5, the Amplified Version says, even if he sins against you, how many times? Seven times a day. And returns seven times a day and says, I repent, you? Yeah, let me tell you something. Somebody did something to you wrong seven times in a day, you know what you'd say? They're not really sorry. That's what's wrong with them. Come on, you know there's two types of people here, right? 
one part is like me. I'm a professional repenter. I've been married for 42 years. I'm a professional repenter. So when something's wrong, I go, baby, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm just, okay. And then usually a professional repenter is usually married to somebody who doesn't repent very often. Baby, I know you're here, but I have to tell the truth. I'm a Christian. <laughs> oh, she said Valentine's is February the 14th, and we're going to Scottsdale. <laughs> okay, y'all, this might cost me a night of pleasure, but I got to say it. <laughs> Christian called me the other day, my son who's preaching uh, Valley Rise Church, if y'all ever go to Tom Ball, the Woodlands, go over and see him. And he calls me the other day, he goes, Daddy, I am so mad. I am so mad. I said, well, what, what are you mad about? He goes, well, you know, Alex is a fitness guru and she works out all the time. And yeah, he said, you know, I was in the military. I said, yeah, son, I, I know you were in the military. He goes, she always wants us to work out together. I don't want to work out with her. She works out differently than I do, but this is what she wants us to do to bond together. So she said, let's work out together. So I said, okay, let's work out together. She said, a month ago, we we're working out together and I'm doing push-ups. She goes, you're doing push-ups wrong. <laughs> he said, I turned around and looked at her and said, if you ever tell me that again, I will get up and walk out of here and never work out with you again. <laughs> okay. She did it. I said, she did what? He goes, she did it this morning. We were working out. I'm doing push-ups. And she goes, you're doing push-ups wrong. I told you. I told you if you did that, I'm done. And he just left the gym. Just left. So he picks up the phone. He calls me. That made me so mad. I said, I, I, I can understand that. I, does it make you, has mom ever done anything like that to you? <laughs> yes. She has. Yes, mama's done things I didn't want her to do or said things. Yes, in 42 years, it happened once. <laughs> I'm thinking of Valentine's Day. <laughs> she said, but the worst part about Alex is she never apologizes. She never apologizes. I mean, how could you live with the person that never apologizes? I said, yeah, I understand. He goes, mama's never apologized. I said, well, we've been married 40 years. She probably apologized like. <laughs> 10 or 15 times. And he goes, how do you deal with that? Doesn't that make you angry? Isn't that just, it makes you angry. I go, no, mama's got other ways of apologizing that I like better than I'm sorry. <laughs> See, some people's love language is words of affirmation. Others is acts of service. <laughs> Remember, this is a relationship series. <laughs> Today, forgiveness cannot be rooted in my faith in people. I love what Dr. Darius Daniels, my favorite preacher, says, because I'm human, I don't do some things imperfectly. I do everything imperfectly. Have any of you ever hurt somebody's feelings you didn't know it? How many have? Okay, raise your hands high if you have. Okay, the other people that don't have their hands down, that's the people whose feelings you hurt. <laughs> I, I mean, literally, you, you, you hurt people's feelings. You don't even know. I, people walk up to you, you know what you did two years ago when you were, I'm like, What? That's why the Bible says if you're offended by someone, go to that person. Or if you offend someone, go to that person. Because there's times you don't know. You're one of the last things Jesus said on the cross. If the Son of God could say that, who knows everything? Then there are people that truly hurt us that don't know what they are doing. They don't know what they're doing. It takes faith to release people and to trust that God's got it. God's got it. God's got it. Number three, only the forgiven can truly forgive. 
Only the forgiven can truly forgive. God gives forgiveness to me so he can give forgiveness through me to others. He's the source. When I hear things that have happened to people and they share their story with me, and in your mind you're thinking, how in the world could you forgive that person for doing that to you? When I've talked to people, things they've done to themselves. How could you forgive yourself for doing that? Look at me. You're not the source of forgiveness, and I'm not the source of forgiveness. He is. I've been a Christian 42 years. I, I remember what I laid down 42 years ago, or 51 years ago. I've been married 42 years. I'm sorry, married Christian. I, I, I haven't smoked weed in 50 years. I've been tempted a number of times. That's a joke. Okay. I, I haven't been drunk in 50, over 50 years. I have all those things that I laid down, but every day I still visit the cross and ask God to forgive me. And do you know what? Look at me. There's always forgiveness available. Have you ever prayed this? And forgive us our as what you're saying is, God, the same way I release others, release me. The same way I forgive others, forgive me. That's what you're praying. Did you know that? So that if you're saying, I refuse to let go, you're actually asking God to refuse to let go of your sin. Only the forgiven can truly forgive. I have limited grace. He has unlimited grace. I have limited ability to forgive. He has unlimited ability to forgive. And when I get to the place where I can't forgive, I don't need to go the person first. I need to go the person that I go to every day to forgive me first. Number four, it's not my love for others that empowers me to forgive them. It's my love for God. It's, it's my love for God. But when I can't forgive others, it's not because I can't forgive what they've done to me. It's because I have forgotten what I've done to God and others. Number five, finally, forgiveness is not an option if you're a Christian. It's obedience. You're not a hero if you forgive. You're a Christian. In the beginning of this message, I told you that the leper story was tied to Jesus talking about being offended. Let me tell you what I mean by that. I don't know if you know this, but I'm an expert on two things you probably don't want to tell other church members about. Are you ready? First is, I'm an expert in hookers. And prostitutes, it's true. I lived in a bar. Several worked for my mother in the bar. And I didn't see them, the position of the seductiveness and the alcohol and the music. I saw them from the brokenness of their lives, their children, their families, the hopelessness, the abuse they came out of. I saw a different side of that. Here's the second thing I'm an expert in, probably the only one you know. I'm an expert in leprosy. My grandmother had leprosy. My uncle had leprosy and my aunt had leprosy. When I was about 10 or 11 years old, I, they were going to get checked up as they did every year. And the one lone leper colony left in the United States, does anybody know where it was? Where? It's in Carville, Louisiana right over the Sunshine Bridge. They just closed it in the last 10 years. And, and my, my uncle would go and he would tell me that when you went there, you could go fishing, you could play ping pong. They had pool tables. And I'm like, kid from the Mexican ghetto of Houston, I'm like, let's go. He said, but if you go, you got to get checked. I said, all right. I get there and man, first day I'm playing ping pong and everything. And, and, and the guy standing across from me playing ping pong, he got like two fingers. Other people come walking across, they got like half an ear. I remember one guy I played with, he had half a nose. And different parts of their body would fall off. I, I, 
I didn't understand all of that till the next day. So the next day I went in to get checked and the way you get checked is you go in and they take a, a razor blade and they nick off a part of your ear. Now I have very large ears, thank God. And he cut and I went, ah, that hurts. He goes, be glad, most people don't feel it. What, what leprosy does is it actually begins, here's, here's the actual doctor's definition The effects of leprosy is it affects the skin and the nerves in the hands and the feet and the eyes. If untreated, it can cause deformities in the hands, feet, blindness, kidney failure. So what happens is leprosy begins to affect the nerves and it kills them off and blood flow begins to stop and literally parts of your body begin to rot off like rotten wood. What happens when you walk and unforgiveness, number one, it affects your nerves. You're touchy and easily offended. You're touchy and easily offended. Number two, it affects your hands. Unforgiveness is contagious. When you talk to people that are walking around with unforgiveness, it's, they're like people that are a Coke can that got shook up. And any time you touch it, it spews out on everybody. It affects your feet. You, oh, I can't go around them. Why? I don't like them. You know how they are. It causes blindness. You begin to see people only through offense. It keeps you at a distance from people. Lepers were required to stay 100 yards away from anyone who was healthy. They would have to yell out, unclean, unclean, because leprosy was contagious. There are four stages that happen after you hold on to offense. The first one is you're hurt. You're hurt. The second one is, if you hold on to that hurt, it becomes unforgiveness. If you hold on to unforgiveness long enough, it becomes resentment. Resentment. And then the final stage is bitterness. How many of you, I'm describing people you know, raise your hand. Listen to what Paul writes in Hebrews chapter 12, 15. Exercise foresight. And be on watch to look out for one another and see that no one falls back and fails to secure God's grace, his unmerited favor and spiritual blessing in order that no of resentment, rancor, bitterness, or hatred shoots forth and causes and when when you hold on to unforgiveness, you don't just torment other people. You torment yourself. You torment yourself. And many become contaminated by it and what? Defiled by it. You see, when when you hold on to offense, offense becomes offense. It does. Hey, man, do you know John? Oh, yeah, I know John. You're not going to. You don't know this. A lot of you are sitting here. When people look at you, they look at you this way. And again, I'm always amazed at people who walk around like this, always want to be close to people and can't figure out why they don't have any close friends. Take down all of your fences. Take them down. Pastor, will I be hurt again? But there's only one thing worse. Living a lonely, selfish life because you were unwilling to allow yourself to love someone. Love hurts. Ask God. No one is more loving than him and nobody has been more hurt than him, but it hasn't stopped him from loving you and me. Aren't you grateful? This this word resentment is really, really interesting because the word resent actually means if you take it, it's root word. Re means to, to do over. And the last part, sentiment, means to feel. In other words, whenever that person comes up, you refill all over again what happened to you. One of the dictionaries says it means to relive. Let, let me show you what I'm talking about. How many have been hurt by people? Raise your hand. How many of people do things to you that you don't want to see them? Come on, you don't want to see them. But do you know what happens if you hold on to resentment? You take them with you. You take them with you. 
You, in your mind, you're going, I don't want to see them. I don't want to be around them. I don't want anything to do with them. Yet your resentment is keeping them attached to you. And every time they come up or someone like them, you relive the same feeling all over again. You, you know what God wants to do? He wants this basketball to stay right here. He, he wants to cut that so that you don't have to drag that around with you forever. Some, some of you have been dragging your daddy and mama around forever, reliving it over and over and over and over and over. I know some of you think, well, Pastor, if, if I let them go, they'll hurt me again. That could be possibly true. But can I tell you this? If you don't let them go, they keep hurting you in perpetuity forever. I, many of you know the story. About 10 years ago, there were two teenage girls that were abducted. A couple took them and sexually and physically abused them, took them to a basement in Detroit in their home and they locked them up in a cage. It, it was a horrible, horrible thing. They were there for almost three years. One day while they were out, a pizza delivery man was going to a house next door and they heard something and they began crying out and he called the police and the police came and discovered these girls that had been there for three years. One of them had even had a baby for the man. The story was all on all the newspapers back then when there was newspapers. And about a year later, I was watching the news and they said, tomorrow morning on one of the news shows, this girl that was trapped for three years, had a baby from this man, is going to be being interviewed. She's written a book. So the next morning I got up, I was eager to hear what she had to say. And the interview began with what happened to her, showed the you know, replay of different circumstances that happened in the news when they were abducted and people looking for them and then when they were discovered. And the part of the interview got to where the interviewer looked at, at her and said, how have you dealt with this? You even had a child from this man. How, how can you not look at the child and think of this man? How have you dealt with this? And she said, I forgave him. I forgave her. And the interviewer said, how in the world could you forgive what happened to you? And she said, I gave them three years of my life. I refuse to give them one day more. I cut it. I, I put down the fence. I'm not going to give them any more. Do you know that science now tells us that when we are hurt, that a chemical is released in the back of our brain that causes that actual part of you to stop? There are many of you here that have 30-year-old bodies, but emotionally you're 12 years old because you had a trauma that hit you at 12, and you've never grown emotionally beyond that. I'm so glad that science has finally caught up with Scripture. Because Jesus has been telling us for 2,000 years that the pathway to freedom for us is forgiving all who have hurt us. All who have hurt us. L listen carefully to me. God hurt with you hurt. The world's never been what God wanted it to be since the fall in the garden. He never wanted you abandoned. He never wanted a child left. He never wanted a brokenness. He never wanted the core longings of your life to be secure, to be safe, to be loved, to be accepted. He never wanted those taken away from you. That was never God's plan. Jesus came to reinstitute God's plan that fell in the garden because of man. Now he will never leave us or forsake us. I love Michelle. But one day she's going to die or I'm going to die. 
The only one that will never leave me or forsake me is named Jesus. The one that found me when I was 14 years old in a bar. He's my comfort. He's my joy. He's the lover of my soul. He's the one that will never, ever leave me and completely understands me, even when I don't even understand myself. So, Pastor, what, what, what do I need to do if I've walked down this path of hurt and unforgiveness and resentment and bitterness? I want to give you four practical steps in the last three minutes. Number one, remember who you need to forgive. The Holy Spirit has brought those people to you as I've been talking. They've been popping up in front of you. Number two, repent. The word means, repent means to see, to hate, and to turn away. It means I was going this direction. I stop, I turn about this way, and I go this direction, the opposite way. God, forgive me. I've come to you over and over and asked you to forgive me of my sin at the cross and at the same time refuse to forgive others. You need to repent. You need to tell God that you're sorry for asking for him which you refuse to give to others. Here's the third thing you need to do. Release them by faith. How many of you asked God to forgive you this week? Raise your hand. How many of you believe he forgave you? Did you hear an audible voice? Answer? Did you have a big feeling come over you where you got the free songs? No. Did you get a phone call from the church going, we heard you just asked God to forgive you. He wanted us to send you an email, but we thought we'd go ahead and call. You're forgiven. Answer? You forgave by faith. Because his word says, if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So what you did is you asked him, and by faith you received it, correct? So guess how you forgive people? By faith. You know what Jesus said? You can speak to the mulberry tree. Because it takes more than faith, it takes your mouth. My mouth and my mind need to come into agreement with God. My mouth and my mind need to come. Well, pastor, how about if tomorrow I don't feel like I forgive? Then you forgive them again. Like you need forgiveness every day, you forgive it every day. You, you know what God's antidote is for people that have hurt you? You ready? Pray for them and bless them. One lady who had been very hurt by her husband said it like this. I discovered that the person that was the villain in my story was the victim in another story. I discovered that the person that was the villain in my story was the victim in his story. So right now I know the Holy Spirit is speaking to you because he's good like that. I'm going to ask you to bow your head with me right now. And I'm going to ask you to hold your palms open on your lap, your hands wide open. And I want you to say this to me, Holy Spirit, I receive what you've spoken to me today through your word, through your spirit. Today I'm open now I want you to close your hands and make like a fist and I want you to say this to me today Holy Spirit I repent for asking for forgiveness that's unlimited for me yet making it limited to others Forgive me. I repent. Today, by faith, in obedience to God's word, I release. And I want you to open your hands. I release. And then under your breath, I want you to name the people that God brings to your mind through the Holy Spirit right now. Under your mind, just whisper. 
So under your breath, whisper their names. It's moms, it's dads, it's exes, it's children, it's workers, it's bosses. Maybe it's yourself. Now repeat this with me. For what they've done, for what they said, for what they should have done that they didn't do, I release them just like you released me. I lay their sin at the very cross where I laid mine today. I bless them, help them, reveal yourself to them, touch them as you've touched me. And with your hand still open like that, I'm just going to pray a moment. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. <sighs> Breathe on your children. Let them feel you dear and close to them now. You know the hurt. You know the pain. We're not overlooking any of that. We're just releasing it, knowing, holding on to it, won't heal it. We're releasing it because we're not going to give them any more the lie of the enemy, the accuser who constantly reminds me of what they did. The same liar who constantly reminds me of what I've done. Today, I release and forgive them. And I bless them now. I bless them now. And right now, the Holy Spirit is coming and ministering to every heart here right now. That's him. He's here. He's here. He's here. Come on, let it go. He's here. He's here. It's okay if you cry. He's here. It's okay. Release them. I want to ask you the most important question in the world. Why is it the most important question, Pastor? Because your eternity depends on it. Your life here on earth depends on it. Have you been born again? Pastor, what does that mean? When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, man spiritually died. And every person born since Adam and Eve has been born spiritually dead. Mother Teresa was born spiritually dead. Billy Graham was born spiritually dead. You and I were born spiritually dead. Our relationship with God begins the moment that we are born again. So I'm going to ask you just to be still for about 30 seconds. I want you to bow with me. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, I believe in God and I believe in Jesus. I may have been christened, baptized, or even joined the church, but, but I've never prayed to be born again. Jesus said in John chapter 3 to a very religious man, unless you're born again, you won't see the kingdom of heaven. You won't enter into it. You don't see it and you don't get it until you become spiritually alive. Then you know God. The God that's been pursuing you, the God that's been chasing you. You, you got to understand, you've been running from him. He leaves the 99 that are doing good to chase. All you got to do is stop running. And he's there. And today's your day. And Jesus said to that man named Nicodemus, if you're born again, then you'll see the kingdom of heaven. You're entering into it. You will begin to know the God that you desire and that desires you so much. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if you're hearing, just say, Pastor, I believe in God and I believe in Jesus, but I've never prayed to be born again. Pastor, would you pray for me today? I want to know God. I don't want to stay away. I want to stop running from him. I know he's been chasing me. I want to know the God that loves me so much. I want a new beginning. I've never prayed to be born again. If that's you, I'm going to count to three. And on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand just so I can pray with you right in your seat, right where you are. One, God brought you here. Nothing is an accident. Two, 
He has been relentlessly pursuing you because he loves you. He's not mad at you. Why would someone who loves you that much do all that he's done to try to draw you to himself? Because he wants you. And now's your time to know him, to be born again. Three, if that's you, lift your hand high. I want to pray for you right where you are. Lift it high. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Anywhere else? Fifteen. Anywhere else? Sixteen. All right. Seventeen. Okay, eighteen, nineteen. Put your hands down. Last ten seconds. Pastor, I didn't raise my hand with these nineteen, but I should have. I know it's what I need. I know the Holy Spirit's speaking to me. I don't know why I didn't raise my hand. Raise it and wave it at me right now. I'm asking this last time for you. 20, 21, 22, 23. All right. Church, let's pray out loud with everyone that raised their hand to be born again today, to have a new beginning in Christ. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe that on the cross, you took my guilt, my sin, and my shame and you died for it. I believe you faced hell for me so I would not have to go. And you rose from the dead to give me a place in heaven, a purpose on earth, and a relationship with your Father. Today, Lord Jesus, I turn away from sin to be born again. Today, God is my Father, Jesus is my Savior, and I am born again in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you enjoy that message? Would you stand up on your feet with me? Hey, if you just made that decision to give your life to Jesus, your next step is water baptism. You can grab one of these blue gate connected cards in front of you, check that box and leave it on your pew. Well, would you bow your heads as I bless you before we leave, before I dismiss you? May the Lord bless you and may he keep you and may he make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. And may all that you set your hand to, may it first be for the kingdom and may he honor it, prosper it, and bless it. And as your pastor, I bless you in the name of the Father, his son Jesus.